Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have three more colonies in our Colony Fixer Upper series. This first one, coming all the way from Scotland, Carol sends us a colony where they say they're pretty hopeless. And I don't know if you can consider any colony that has these beautiful condominiums hopeless. There's a lot of good positives here. And personally, I absolutely love the aesthetic around this colony. It's like trying to traverse a maze outside the main base. Like I know there's stuff going on down here, but I'm not sure how to get there. It's like playing a game of find the missing dupe. Oh, look at all the beautiful diamond down here. The lead. An absolute smorgasbord of igneous rock and fossil. Seriously though, why are there so many slicksters? We have some slicksters over here in a nice little habitat, but then we just have some random slicksters. And they decided they want to move. So there's some here. There's some here. There's some here. Yep, you get the picture. There's more slicksters over here. Now beside the fun with slicksters, Carol also says that they're running out of dirt. We're down to 84 tons of dirt, so they're trying to reclaim some using the compost method. I suppose the reason they want some dirt is because of the mealwood up here feeding some of these few hatches. And then we have more of a dirt requirement for these glossy drecos. So I would start off saying that if you want more dirt and you only want to do it by composting, well then it's time to increase your compost by a lot. With that being said, you only have 70 tons of polluted dirt, but to at least get through that, I would do something like this and just go ham with the compost. Remember though, you might want to put a sink before you start dealing with the compost, because every time the dupes come in here and they start digging up the polluted dirt, they get germy. Now it may not be that big of a deal because the duplicates are in suits, but still, a lot of people don't use compost. There's probably a couple of reasons. A, they generate a decent amount of heat. So you would have to make sure that you cool this area. But the second reason why is because other than the polluted dirt, there's just faster ways to get regular dirt. And that's just to boil all of this polluted water. And when you boil polluted water, dirt comes out the other side. And there is a lot of polluted water to go around. Now, unfortunately, I still can't find a polluted water source, so that solution would only be finite, but I am sure there's a polluted water something around here. There it is. The cool slush geyser. Absolutely. Boil everything that's coming out of this cool slush geyser. And there's your dirt needs taken care of. And you definitely don't have to worry about water, because using the trick here, you have an entire water geyser which those are rare to begin with. I would definitely tap into that water geyser and start getting some of that great clean water. Just for giggles, let's go ahead and open this up and see what we find. 10.1 kilos per second at 95 degrees. Even if it ended up having a relatively low active period, it's still erupting almost 50% of the time during that active period. At 10.1 kilos per second for 299 seconds, that's almost three tons of water every single time it erupts. So you can definitely keep doing it this way with the compost and eat through some of that polluted dirt. But I would definitely get busy boiling all that polluted water as well. Additionally, I think this is a pair of great glossy Draco ranches. You might be able to save on the mealwood cost though. I've seen a ranch of eight Dracos survive off of just three mealwoods. Also, disable the auto harvest on all of these plants. Your dupes don't need to eat the mealwood. That's just for the glossy Drecos. Remember, the glossy Drecos don't eat the meal lice. They only want to eat the actual plant. So if you let this plant grow and sit at 100% until some glossy Dreco comes around and eats it, A, you won't have to plant as many of them, and B, you're going to save on the dupe labor because they don't need to be harvested. I also wanted to take a moment to look at their rocketry program. We have two cabins here, but both very interesting designs. One of them I think is particularly cool. Instead of just loading up the water before this thing flies off, we have a liquid reservoir filled with 5 tons of water. With the 10 tons of oxalite, and you drop off a bunch of berry sludge, this ship could stay out in space for a long time. If you were looking for an alternate though, because all you'd have to do is come right out of this output and start snaking around this pipe. Now obviously this example is not going to go great because we already have a liquid reservoir and some other pipes, but you kind of get the examples. You could fill the entire cabin with pipes and then put it into the toilet. And then whenever the rocket lands, it's connected to a reservoir and it fills up automatically like that. Either way works. 
but you might get a little bit more time and space using the liquid reservoir. We also have an adorable little colony on Uzala, which is the closest planetoid to the main, but these dupes have massage tables, they have cots, they even have the nice crafting station, which means there's some oxygen masks around here somewhere. Here they are. I love using these little oxygen masks. Yes, they're not as good as suits, but guess what it doesn't take to repair an oxygen mask? You don't need Thimble Reed in your oxygen mask creation or their repair, which makes them a perfect alternative and even an easier alternative on some planetoids that getting access to Thimble Reed is a little bit more difficult. I also did the trick again. This is a polluted water vent and it's sitting right next to another cool slush geyser. There are tons of water sources between these two colonies, not to mention the primary cool slush geyser on the main planetoid. Finally, I wanted to point out Carol's method for storing gas. This is all natural gas coming out of this natural gas geyser. And we even have a bunch of carbon dioxide in this area. Look folks, don't shake your head at just brute forcing a problem. This is an absolute massive amount of natural gas and you can use it whenever you need and you'll still have plenty of room because there's so much area in here for the natural gas to go into. It's simple, it works, and it's easy. The only thing I would add though is you might want to put a liquid lock here. There's a couple of reasons why. Not that it's such a huge deal that there's a bunch of gases around here, but you've also got a bunch of carbon dioxide here. So as soon as the dupes come through this door, all this polluted oxygen is going to rush in here, and the polluted oxygen is going to rush in here, or the natural gas is going to rush out. Either way, then you're going to start mixing gases, which is A, going to kill your frame rates, and B, it might impact your system, especially considering you're trying to pump all the gases out by themselves. Love the colony, Carol. I appreciate you sending it to me. And I could just stare at this for hours. I think Clay is definitely missing the mark. They could be selling huge posters of just things like that. Because I know they'd at least have one buyer of that giant poster. With all the different biomes coming together. Little tunnels running through them. Occasionally a Meemaw disinfecting some lockers. You know, the little things in life. Thanks again, Carol. Our next colony comes from Kim Puckridge, a.k.a. No musicians in music anymore. I'm pretty sure they have the longest screen name that shows up in our comments. I wanted to start off by saying, look how much space is built into this base. It is absolutely wonderful. There is plenty of room to work. No matter where you go, there's lots of room. Even these barracks, plenty of room for more activities. And look at these bathrooms. They're outfitted with duplicate motion sensors, which means whenever they go to the bathroom, they're going to go to the bathroom quicker. They're also going to wash their hands quicker. And then we have some nice end game food. We have shovels here. Now Kim's showing off a little bit because they have 220,000 calories worth of frost burgers. And you'd think it'd all be coming from these shovels. But nope, they're running hatches too. We're also running Drecos. And in this Dreco ranch, we actually have two breeder Drecos, which then throws all the eggs inside of a starvation ranch. But before they die of hunger, we make sure to shear them. Very efficient. And then we have an absolute beautiful industrial sauna. You want one way to spin up your industrial sauna pretty quick? Well, build it around a cool steam vent. Then you don't have to worry about turning all that water into steam. The steam vent does that for you. Next, we have this absolutely beautiful volcano. Sitting almost right in the middle of the base. Plenty of stored up magma for all sorts of fun and games. A perfect magma dropper here, which leads to the mechanized airlock, which drops some igneous rock into this little room here. The first thing I wanted to highlight is that Kim was using the old school method of opening and closing the door using the filter gate and the buffer gate. And there's nothing wrong with this. It works very well. But since the advent of the timer sensor, I prefer this method. And there's a couple of reasons why. First, I think it's far simpler. You just throw a thermo sensor and a timer sensor onto an AND gate and then connect the AND gate to the door. And you can get the exact same control out of this. If this room's temperature is lower than say 200 degrees, flip the thermo sensor to green. And then you could have the timer sensor flipping from on to off every two seconds say. And that way this door would never open for longer than two seconds. But what I like about this implementation better than the old one is you could also do it where this door would only even attempt to open once per cycle or once per 10 cycles. What you can do with the timer sensor combined with what the functionality you need with the thermo sensor is almost unlimited. 
And because of that, I think you can get a lot more finite control with the timer sensor with maybe a couple steps easier than this current setup here. Now we have a pretty straightforward system. The igneous rock comes in, it gets twirled around this steam room for long enough to dump all of its heat in here. And then this conveyor rail thermo sensor checks it and sees if it's below 150 degrees. If it is, this conveyor shutoff turns on, dumps it over into this room. Now this room is supposed to be very, very cold, which would then finish that igneous rock up to where this conveyor thermo sensor would then check to make sure it's below 25 degrees before shipping it off to the rest of the colony. Unfortunately, because it's only cycle 492, and wait till I show you everything that Kim has accomplished in 492 cycles, they've had to resort to using crude oil. And the reason why is because we're running two thermo aqua tuners in series. So the potential for cooling here for one blob of crude oil is 28 degrees. Now you could use a polluted water, which has a slightly better thermal conductivity than crude oil or petroleum, but then you'd have to worry about the polluted water getting too cold and turning to ice. Hence the reason why Gim is trying to use crude oil. So in this case, I have a recommendation. Instead of sending the igneous rock through this steam turbine room, which we clearly might not have the cooling potential in order to take care of these steam turbines so they stay on, send the igneous rock through this cold biome that's conveniently located right next to it. Don't discount your cold biomes, folks. They'll last for a very long time. And by then, Hopefully you'd have some super coolant to throw in here and fix this system up nice. But it's not like Kim needs any power. We have a fully functioning petroleum boiler here. This petroleum boiler is powered by geothermal spike. Oh, look at this. Some dirty laundry. You can almost see exactly what happened here. The mechanized airlock may have mistakenly been built with cobalt first, which it then instantly liquefied and dropped down here. When I'm chuckling about this, it's not at you. I'm chuckling because I've done the same thing a hundred times. Now Kim was specifically asking what the next direction for this colony should be. Considering that they got some infinite gas storage with over 700 kilos of natural gas, a beautiful gold volcano giving us all the gold we need. Yeah, we're also running infinite liquid storage too. Plenty of water stored up. I'd say the sky's the limit. And isn't that one of the greatest things about this game? You don't have to worry about going in one direction or another. It's only cycle 492, and look at everything that's been accomplished. That's pretty impressive. If it were me, I'd probably start heading off into space, only for the reason I'd want that super coolant. That way we could have this system running right as rain. Thanks again, Kim, for sending in the colony. Our next colony is from Andrew Consiglio, and I apologize if I'm butchering that. And Andrew sends another beautiful display of a colony. I absolutely love how it's just sort of built in to the environment here, really conserving a lot of the natural biomes. We're not going to worry about the bathroom mess right now. That's not a big deal. But we have some nice little rooms here, sort of like an apartment building with beautiful decor, a convenient recreation room, a nice little makeshift hospital up here. We're running some arbor trees and oh my, don't look directly at the pipes. So I say that comment a little tongue in cheek. Andrew says, and I quote, the piping system is so complex that even I have a hard time understanding how it all works together. Each pipe has been laid to solve a problem, and each new pipe laid has started another. Oh, that's some oxygen not included for you, isn't it? There are so many great, beautiful gems of pipe spaghetti around here. It is absolutely magnificent. Here's one bowl of spaghetti for you. Oh, here's another. I mean, everybody has room for a third bowl of spaghetti. Hey, instead of spaghetti this time, let's have some fettuccine. All jokes aside, I know exactly what Andrew is suffering with here. And this is why it's critically important to take your time. Let's take a note of the fact that it's only cycle 366. This is a pretty good footprint for cycle 366. And unfortunately, the cost of having this much base so quickly may have been the fact that we had to skip a little bit on the organization of the pipes. Now, Andrew here is still running mealwood. Not a big deal especially considering they got 450 tons of dirt. And if you ever run out of dirt, you can start boiling this beautiful cool slush geyser and grab more dirt from it. So I've never really had a problem running meal wood into the mid or even late game. It could very easily be a staple crop as long as you have the materials to run it. A couple things to keep in mind. You're going to have to make sure that your morale on your dupes stays high enough, but 
Clearly, Andrew's done a good job with that with plenty of decor. And then you have to make sure you have enough dirt, which clearly he does. Now, you may have already noticed, but there's a couple other cool things featured on this seed that Andrew's running. Oh, yes. Look at that radiation overlay. We have a bunch of wrecked and crashed satellites that could provide some radiation for a long time to come. I mean, this one's conveniently located towards the top of your base, which means maybe this is the start of a future rocketry program. Of course, Andrew's taking it into his own hands. He padded a couple of Wheeze warts with the Radbolt generator, and it's providing all the Radbolts they need. In fact, 744 rads per cycle, which comes out to be about 74 Radbolts. Couple more recommendations. We have our power being provided by some wood burners, thanks to the arbor trees we showed off earlier, but they are not conveniently located right under your base, and they push off a pretty good amount of heat, and I'd be worried about these crops in the long term. In fact, you can already see some of them starting to stifle, but that's not the only problem. Andrew admits that he may have dug a bit too low, and as a matter of fact, he did. But what has me worried, because Andrew sent me this file on January 1st, and I would hate to think how many cycles they've gotten further in this game. But there's a problem. Andrew is under the impression that he was able to seal it off, which he did with some insulated tiles here and some insulated tiles here. Unfortunately, these are manual airlocks. These manual airlocks are definitely transferring temperature from this side of the colony to this side of the colony. So that means that heat is transferring all the way over here, coming up here, and then goes up through here. Now, I think Andrew's idea was that heat would just slowly travel into the cold biome and nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, that heat's also going to be sharing with this granite. You can see these first few layers of granite are already 70 degrees. So eventually, that heat is going to expand up through these tiles. And it's only for that reason that I would say it's probably time to insulate your entire base in. I'm afraid about the long-term effects of all the heat that's being dumped in here, unless you can start sealing off every avenue of it. I mean, we even have steam problems here, and I love seeing bases that aren't walled in. But in this case, because we're going to have those heat problems, I would definitely recommend it. At least the bottom half. And I just figured out where the rest of that heat was coming from. It's not even coming from over here. It's coming from right here. The magma is connected to these ladders, and behind the ladders is carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is not the best thermal conductor, but eventually it's going to heat all of these ladders up, which means it's going to heat this granite up. So you may think that this one insulated tile will do it, and it will do it for now. But obsidian and granite will still start passing on that temperature. If I were you, I would do something like this. Make sure that the only thing this heat is touching is this abyssalite. The beauty of abyssalite, and the reason why it covers the entire magma biome, it has a thermal conductivity of zero. This is beautiful. It looks like Andrew is also going to expand over in here and start tapping into the radiation potential of this satellite as well. I was trying to figure out why all the duplicates kept peeing all over the place. We have four bathrooms here, which is pretty good. And then I turned on the schedule. There are 12 duplicates on the daytime shift. Andrew's done a great job of taking the night owls and putting them on their own shift. But everybody who's not on a night owl is on this shift here. Which means when they hit that downtime, they need to go pee and they need to go pee now. So there's 12 dupes all trying to use the bathroom. And there's only four stalls. Hence the reason some dupes are like, okay, I can't hold it anymore. We're going right here. Now, if you want to leave all the duplicates on one shift, that's not a big deal. You just need a lot more bathrooms to be able to cover all of these duplicates needing to use the bathroom at the same time. And I do have a question for Andrew. We have all these wonderful dupes. Max, Nisbet, Stinky, all the standards. And then there's an Alfonso. I've never seen an Alfonso. I'm wondering, who's Alfonso? Every other dupe has a natural name that comes straight out of the printing pod. Not Alfonso. Alfonso got the special treatment. If you see your base like this, I'm going to give you the same advice that I want to give Andrew. Slow down. Take your time. You're not in any sort of rush. Well, sometimes we're in a rush for oxygen and food. But as far as the expansion of your base, it's only cycle 367. And while I love this sort of setup, it looks like the base sort of naturally expands out like a city does. But sometimes if you don't plan it out a little bit, you're going to end up with a bowl of spaghetti 
that you might not be able to eat. Now, this is the second episode of our Colony Fixer Up series, and I want to give a special thanks and hats off to Andrew. Out of the six colonies we've seen, this one is probably my favorite. Yeah, it's got a lot of little things wrong with it. In fact, I'm pretty sure the colony is in a real situation where it could just perish. But what it does represent is ambition. It grows out like a natural city, and it looks gorgeous. Yeah, there's definitely some infrastructure problems, but the fact that Andrew decided to share this colony with us when his dupes are meeting mealwood and peeing their pants is pretty awesome in my book. I mean, if they get too dirty, they can just take a spin in the hot tub, right? So hats off to Andrew for sending this colony. Keep plugging away at it. Now that about wraps up for this episode. I still actually have three more save files ready to go. So you know another Colony Fixer Upper episode is going to be coming around the corner. A word of warning though, if you send me a colony that requires mods, sometimes even if I download that mod, it's just not going to work right. So I ask that if you are trying to send me a colony, make sure it doesn't have any mod limitations in order to start it. In our next episode of Colony Fixer Upper, we'll be looking at colonies from Raphael and Jose. I can't wait to give those colonies a good look. I had a blast looking at these three. Thank you again for sending in the colony. Great work. All three colonies are beautiful in their own right. I hope you had as good of a time exploring them as I did. And I'll talk to you soon.